couple things you have to accept when you walk into these walls. And one is you may not walk out. My religion of Katoni Ashwabel, that's the underworld. He was like on the mummy, the black book. So this was them. This torch in it. It's in Seattle. Cops don't know about it. I need a favor, Chrissy. Behind these steel bars and concrete walls lies a world most of us only glimpse in our worst nightmares. A place where the rules of society crumble, and only the strongest, smartest, and most ruthless survive. And in the heart of these concrete jungles reside figures so feared, so notorious, that even the most hardened criminals tremble at the mere mention of their name. Who are they? And what deeds have earned them such infamy? Join us on this gripping adventure as we unveil the most feared men in U.S. prisons. Number 10. Nico Jenkins. Imagine a man so dangerous that he's been sentenced to 450 years in prison. This man is Nico Jenkins, a master manipulator and a sinister figure who poses a significant threat both to the outside world and even behind bars. Jenkins' life has been troubled from the start. From a young age, he experienced and witnessed numerous traumatic events. By 13, he had already experienced what it was like to stab someone. In 2003, at just 15, he was sent to prison for two armed carjackings. Even behind bars, he continued to cause trouble, attacking a guard and inciting a prison riot. The court added two extra charges, but instead of serving additional time, the sentences ran concurrently, meaning he only served 10 and a half years. In 2013, after being released from prison, Jenkins did not reform. Instead, he went on a brutal killing spree. Just 11 days after his release, he shot and killed two random men, Juan Pena and Jorge Ruiz. Shockingly, he did this with the help of his cousin and sister, using them to lure the men to their deaths before stealing their wallets. Eight days later, Jenkins murdered Curtis Bradford, an old prison buddy. The day before, the two had taken a photo together, showing how little Nico valued friendship. Jenkins' killing spree didn't end there. A few days later, he pulled over a random SUV and shot Andrea Kruger, a mother of three, four times. This time, Jenkins was assisted by his uncle, Warren Levering, adding to the already grim lineup of his sister and cousin. But there was one more accomplice, his mother, Lori Jenkins. She bought Jenkins the ammunition and knew about his horrific actions. On August 30th, 2013, Jenkins was arrested for making threats unrelated to the murders. However, evidence was piling up against him. Surveillance footage showed a woman buying the same type of ammunition used in the killings. Additional footage traced the route to the abandoned SUV of one victim, Andrea Kruger. During a lengthy interview on September 3rd, Jenkins confessed to all four murders, claiming they were sacrifices to the ancient Egyptian god Apophis. He was charged with four counts of murder following this confession. In November 2013, Jenkins wrote letters admitting guilt in four murders, insisting he served the Egyptian god Apophis. He later sued Nebraska for $24.5 million, alleging wrongful release and neglected mental health issues. Despite his claims of schizophrenia worsened by solitary confinement, psychiatrists diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder. Jenkins represented himself in court, claiming obedience to Apophis. He behaved erratically during the trial, laughing and speaking in tongues. On April 16, 2014, he was found guilty. Sentencing was postponed to assess his understanding of death penalty proceedings. Eventually, he was ordered to a psychiatric hospital and then transferred to a prison due to security concerns. In 2017, he was sentenced to death and 450 years for weapons charges. In 2020, the Supreme Court rejected his appeal. Number 9. Richard Lee McNair Richard Lee McNair, born on December 19, 1958, wasn't just any ordinary troublemaker. While he certainly had a knack for giving law enforcement a hard time, his story goes beyond the typical criminal tale of murder, attempted murder, and burglary. Sure, he ended up with two life sentences for those crimes, but what truly sets McNair apart is his remarkable talent for escaping from the clutches of confinement. McNair was convicted of murder in 1987 due to a botched robbery gone wrong, where one man lost his life and another was left wounded. Most would resign themselves to life behind bars, but not McNair. He had an insatiable hunger for freedom that bordered on obsession. Thus began his extraordinary career of breaking free. Not once, not twice, but three good times. 
His first escape was straight out of a Hollywood movie. With nothing but lip balm and sheer nerve, McNair slipped out of his handcuffs and vanished like a magician. But that wasn't enough for him. Four years later, after his rearrest, he ventured further in his second escape, crawling through ventilation shafts, eluding capture once again. It was as if he had a blueprint of the prison etched into his mind. In April 2006, McNair orchestrated the ultimate disappearing act. It's the tale that would make even the most seasoned law enforcement officers scratch their heads in disbelief. McNair, the master of escape, managed to hide cleverly amidst a pile of used postal mailbags. On that very day, later in the afternoon, McNair found himself jogging near some train tracks when a sharp-eyed police officer spotted him. McNair, quick on his feet as always, spun a tale for the officer, claiming he hadn't escaped from prison at all, but was merely getting some exercise in the area. He even went as far as to say he and his brother were lodging at a nearby hotel, all the while stealthily evading the truth of his escape. Not content with just evading capture on home turf, he even made two daring trips to Canada, desperately trying to disappear off the authorities' radar. Fast forward to 2007, well over a year since his daring escape, and McNair's luck finally ran out when Canadian police caught sight of him behind the wheel of a stolen car. Under interrogation, McNair pulled another vanishing act, slipping away from their grasp once more. During his time on the run, McNair wasn't idle. He crafted counterfeit identification cards and utilized computer wizardry to forge driver's licenses and keep tabs on media coverage about his escapades. His daring antics even landed him a spot on Canada's 15 most wanted list, not once, but several times. Then, in November 2007, an observant police officer noticed a van with suspiciously homemade tinted windows. Although McNair had personally tinted them, the officer's instincts kicked in when he realized the van seemed way too fancy for its make. Taking note of the license plate, he promptly reported it. The next day, another officer spotted the van and a chase ensued. When McNair finally parked the van and made a dash for it, he was apprehended by law enforcement. Today, McNair calls ADX Florence home a supermax prison where inmates spend 23 hours a day locked in their cells, closely monitored by guards to prevent any chance of escape. Number 8. Terry Nichols Terry Nichols' life took a dark turn, culminating in one of the most devastating acts of domestic terrorism in American history. Born on April 1, 1995, in Leia, Michigan, he appeared like any other person on the surface. However, hidden beneath was a sinister ideology brewing. Since childhood, Nichols had shown a fascination with survivalism and anti-government sentiments, influenced by events like the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal. Joining the U.S. Army in the 1980s deepened his beliefs, exposing him to like-minded individuals and reinforcing his extremist views. Struggling to find his place after leaving the military, Nichols crossed paths with Timothy McVeigh, who shared his resentment toward the government. Together, they hatched a plan that would leave a lasting scar on the nation the Oklahoma City bombing on April 19, 1995, a dark chapter in American history. On that day, Nichols and McVeigh carried out their plan to wreak havoc on Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. At about 9 in the morning, a colossal explosion shattered the building, reducing it to rubble and leaving devastation in its wake. The blast claimed the lives of 168 individuals, including 19 children, and inflicted injuries on over 500 others. As investigators delved into the incident, Nichols' involvement became increasingly apparent. The ensuing trial became a national spectacle, capturing the attention of the entire country. The prosecution built a compelling case against Nichols, portraying him as a central figure in the bombing. Witnesses testified to his participation, recounting conversations they heard him share about anti-government sentiments. Despite strongly maintaining his innocence and denying any knowledge of McVeigh's intentions, Nichols failed to sway the jury. In 1997, he was convicted on federal charges, including conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction and involuntary manslaughter. Number 7. Ramzi Youssef Ramzi Youssef was born in Kuwait on April 27, 1968, to Pakistani parents. His journey from being an engineering student in the UK to becoming one of the world's most infamous terrorists is a story of radicalization and planned violence. On February 26, 1993, a massive explosion rocked the underground parking garage beneath the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The blast was so powerful, estimated at 150,000 pounds per square inch, that it carved out a hole about 100 feet wide and penetrated through four levels of concrete. The bomb, weighing approximately 1,200 pounds, was a sophisticated device meticulously planned by Ramzi Youssef and his team. They spent months gathering materials and assembling the bomb in a rented storage locker in New Jersey. To avoid suspicion, 
Youssef and his team purchased chemicals commonly used in agriculture, like urea and nitric acid. After igniting the fuse, Youssef and his accomplice, Ad Ismoil, quickly left the scene. They headed to JFK Airport, where Youssef escaped back to Pakistan using false travel documents, while Ismoil flew home to Jordan. The detonation of the bomb caused severe damage, severing the World Trade Center's primary electrical supply and disabling emergency lighting. Smoke from the explosion rose to the 93rd floor of both towers, making evacuation difficult and leading to numerous cases of smoke inhalation. Following the World Trade Center bombing, Youssef's desire for chaos and destruction only intensified. He planned an even more ambitious and sinister plot known as the Bojinka Plot, aiming to cause unprecedented havoc. However, fate intervened when a chemical fire in Youssef's Manila apartment in January 1995 drew attention. Police discovered evidence of the planned attacks, including bomb-making materials and detailed plans. The revelation of the Bojinka plot shocked the international community, leading to increased security measures in airports worldwide, particularly regarding liquid explosives. With authorities closing in, Youssef fled Manila for Pakistan, continuing his pursuit of chaos and destruction. However, his days as a free man were numbered. Youssef was arrested on February 7, 1995, marking a significant turning point in the fight against international terrorism. Agents from Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence, along with U.S. Diplomatic Security Service Special Agents, raided the Sukasa Guest House in Islamabad, Pakistan, capturing Yusuf before he could flee to Peshawar. The trial of Yusuf gained widespread attention worldwide. He faced numerous charges, including his involvement in the World Trade Center bombing and the Bojinka plot. Throughout the trial, Yusuf remained defiant, showing no remorse for his actions. Eventually, he was sentenced to two life sentences, plus 240 years in prison. The judge ordered that his time behind bars be as harsh and challenging as possible, recommending that he serve his entire sentence in solitary confinement. Number 6. Dennis Lynn Rader Dennis Lynn Rader, born on March 9, 1945, is infamously known as BTK, which stands for Bind, Torture, Kill, a chilling moniker he created for himself. From an early age, Raider had dark and disturbing fantasies about torturing women who were trapped and helpless. He also exhibited a cruel streak by torturing, killing, and hanging small animals. These early signs of sadism were just the beginning. Raider developed various sexual fetishes, including voyeurism and cross-dressing. He often spied on his female neighbors while dressed in women's clothing, including stolen women's underwear. During his cooling-off periods between murders, Raider would take photos of himself dressed in women's clothes and a female mask, while bound in various positions. He later confessed that these acts were part of his sexual fantasies, where he pretended to be his victims. Despite these perverse activities, Raider managed to keep his dark desires hidden from those around him. To his community, he appeared normal, polite, and well-mannered, successfully maintaining a facade that concealed his true nature. Between 1974 and 1991, Raider unleashed a reign of terror on Wichita and Park City, Kansas. He claimed at least 10 victims, with a particular focus on women. His audacity knew no bounds. He sent taunting letters to the police and media, bragging about his heinous deeds and basking in the horror he caused. After a 13-year break from his deadly activities, Raider resurfaced in 2004, sending those disturbing letters once again. This proved to be his undoing. In 2005, authorities finally caught up with him near his home in Park City. When an officer asked if he knew why he was being taken downtown, Raider ominously replied, Oh, I have suspicions why. The subsequent investigation was thorough. They searched his house, car, and frequent haunts, including his church and his office at City Hall. The evidence they uncovered was shocking. Computer files, a pair of black pantyhose hidden in a shed, and a mysterious cylindrical container. This exhaustive search brought an end to BTK's horrific spree. Today, Raider resides in the El Dorado Correctional Facility, serving 10 consecutive life sentences, forever behind bars for his monstrous crimes. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. In the dark corridors of the maximum security prison, whispered tales echoed of the most feared man in US prison. It was said that his mere presence could send shivers down the spine of even the most hardened inmates. They called him Shadow a name earned for his uncanny ability to vanish into thin air when the guards' backs were turned. Nobody knew his real name or why he was incarcerated, but his reputation preceded him like a ghost haunting the halls. Rumor had it that Shadow possessed a set of skills that bordered on supernatural. Some claimed he could scale the walls like a spider, 
while others swore he could unlock any door with nothing but a whisper and a flick of his wrist. Prisoners spoke of him in hushed tones, exchanging tales of his legendary escapes and his silent, deadly prowess. His name became a cautionary tale, a warning to those who dared to cross him or even utter his name aloud. Yet amidst the fear and uncertainty, there was a strange fascination that drew people to him like moths to a flame. For in the shadows, there lay a mystery waiting to be unraveled, a story begging to be told. And so, the legend of the most feared man in U.S. prison continued to grow, casting a long, dark shadow over the hearts of all who dwelled within those walls. Number 5. Thomas Edward Silverstein Thomas Edward Silverstein was born on February 4, 1952. Silverstein was born in Long Beach, California, to Virginia Conway. In 1952, Virginia divorced her first husband while she was pregnant with Silverstein. She then married Thomas Conway, whom Silverstein believed to be his biological father. Four years later, Virginia divorced Thomas and married Sid Silverstein, who legally adopted her son. Growing up in a middle-class neighborhood, Silverstein was a timid, awkward, and shy child who often faced bullying. Virginia, his mother, insisted that he stand up for himself. She warned him that if he ever came home crying from a fight, she would punish him again. In 1971, when he was just 19, Silverstein was sent to San Quentin Prison in California for committing armed robbery. After four years, he was released on parole. However, not long after his release, he was arrested again, this time along with his father, Thomas Conway, and his cousin, Gerald Hoff. They had committed three armed robberies together, but only managed to steal less than $11,000, which would be about $53,000 in today's money. In 1977, Silverstein was sentenced to 15 years in prison for these crimes and was sent to the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. While at Leavenworth, Silverstein formed connections with the Aryan Brotherhood, a neo-Nazi prison gang and a criminal organization. In 1980, he was found guilty of murdering inmate Danny Atwell, who had allegedly refused to smuggle heroin within the prison. This conviction led to a life sentence, and Silverstein was transferred to the High Security United States Penitentiary, USP, in Marion, Illinois. At USP Marion, Silverstein was placed in the control unit, essentially a form of solitary confinement reserved for the most dangerous and disruptive inmates. In this harsh environment, he lived under constant surveillance, with a ceiling light that was never turned off. Silverstein was only permitted two phone calls per month. In 1981, Silverstein was accused of murdering Robert Chappelle, a member of the DC Blacks prison gang, along with another inmate, Clayton Fountain. He was found guilty and given an additional life sentence. Luckily for Silverstein, he avoided the death penalty because federal capital punishment had not yet been reinstated. Throughout the trial, Silverstein insisted he was innocent. While Silverstein was being tried for Chappelle's murder, the Bureau of Prisons moved Raymond Lee Cadillac Smith, the national leader of the DC Blacks prison gang, into the control unit at Marion Prison. From the moment Smith arrived, prison records show that he began attempting to kill Silverstein. I told Cadillac I didn't hurt Chappelle, but he didn't trust me. He even said he'd harm me, remembered Silverstein. Everyone knew, but no one stopped it. The guards almost wanted us to fight. Silverstein and Clayton Fountain attacked Smith, stabbing him 67 times with makeshift weapons. Once Smith was gone, they paraded his body in front of other prisoners. As a result, Silverstein got yet another life sentence. On October 22, 1983, Silverstein killed correction officer Merle Klutz at USP Marion. When Silverstein was let out of his cell for a shower, he tricked Klutz into walking in front of him, positioning himself between Klutz and other officers. Stopping outside another inmate's cell, Randy Gomez, Gomez passed a homemade knife to Silverstein and unlocked his handcuffs with a homemade key. Then, Silverstein attacked Klutz, stabbing him many times. Silverstein claimed he did it because Klutz had been harassing him. In 1986, Silverstein was charged, convicted, and sentenced to life in solitary confinement for Officer Cutts's murder. He spent 36 years in solitary confinement until his death on May 11, 2019, at St. Anthony Hospital in Lakewood, Colorado. He was 67 years old and passed away from complications following heart surgery. Number 4. Charles Edmund Cullen Charles Edmund Cullen, an American serial killer, concealed his crimes behind the trusted role of a nurse, a profession meant to save lives. Over 16 terrifying years, he worked in various New Jersey medical centers, where he confessed to possibly ending the lives of 40 patients, with at least 29 confirmed murders. It's chilling to think that someone tasked with caring for the sick could betray that trust, preying on the very people they were meant to help. The nightmare began to unravel on December 12, 2003, when Cullen was arrested. 
Initially charged with one count of murder and one count of attempted murder, it soon became clear that this was just the beginning. During an interrogation two days later, Cullen confessed to killing Florian Gull and attempting to murder Jin Kyung Han, patients at Somerset Medical Center. Shockingly, he hinted at even more victims, suggesting he may have taken the lives of up to 40 people during his career. In April 2004, Cullen pleaded guilty in a New Jersey court to killing 13 patients and attempting to kill two others using lethal injection. In exchange for his cooperation, prosecutors agreed not to seek the death penalty. He later admitted to three more murders. During the legal proceedings, there was a big question. How could someone break their promise to not harm, especially when it's their job to help people? As the court process went on, it became clear that the answers were just as disturbing as the crimes themselves. The guy showed no regret. He even teased the judge, telling them to quit their job. It got so bad they had to shut him up with cloth and tape, like in a scary movie. But it gets creepier. As part of his deal with the law, Cullen agreed to help find more victims. Finally, on March 2nd, 2006, Judge Armstrong in New Jersey sentenced Cullen to 11 life terms in prison, one after the other. He won't even be considered for release until he's 443 years old. Right now, he's stuck in New Jersey State Prison in Trenton. Number 3. Stanley Tookie Williams Stanley Williams, famously known as Tookie, was born into turmoil and instability. When he was just a year old, his father left the family, leaving his mother to raise him alone. Seeking a better life, they moved to South Central Los Angeles in 1959. This area, marked by poverty and crime, became Tookie's new environment, where he would soon confront the brutal realities of street life. During the late 1960s, as the Black Power movement surged, older gangs disbanded, creating a vacuum that new, violent youth gangs quickly filled. Although initially repelled by the violence and chaos, Tookie was eventually drawn into this world. His prowess as a street fighter earned him respect and fear among West Side gangsters. By 15, he was invited to join a small West Side clique, which, under his leadership, grew significantly in size and power. In 1971, a turning point came when Tookie met Raymond Washington, a dynamic young man with a vision. Together, they formed the Crips, Los Angeles' first major African-American street gang. Initially created to protect black communities from racism and police brutality, the Crips soon became a powerful and feared organization. Tookie's reputation soared as he played a key role in establishing a gang that would leave a lasting impact on the city and its history. With his natural leadership skills, Tookie quickly rose to become the de facto leader of the Crips after other leaders were either murdered or imprisoned. Tookie led a double life. By day, he worked as an anti-gang youth counselor. But by night, he commanded one of Los Angeles' largest and most dangerous gangs. The Crips became synonymous with violence, drugs, and chaos, instilling fear in both rival gangs and innocent civilians alike. As the gang's influence expanded, so did the body count. In 1979, Tookie's reign came to an abrupt end when he was arrested for the murder of four people during two robberies. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and in 1981, he was convicted of these brutal crimes and sentenced to death. While on death row, Tookie dedicated his life to promoting peace and preventing gang involvement. He reached out to students and wrote books warning about the dangers of gang life and his efforts earned him Nobel Peace Prize nominations. His case sparked intense debate about the possibility of redemption for a convicted murderer. Despite his efforts at reform, Tookie was executed by lethal injection. Number 2. Rodney Alcala Rodney Alcala's journey began on August 23, 1943, in San Antonio, Texas, where he was born as Rodrigo Jax Alcala Bucor. When Alcala was just eight years old, his family moved to Mexico. It was there that his father abandoned them, leaving a void that would haunt Alcala for the rest of his life. Seeking a fresh start, Alcala, his mother, and his siblings moved to the bustling city of Los Angeles. As a teenager, Alcala's life took a drastic turn. At 17, he joined the army, hoping to find purpose and direction. However, his time in the military was brief. In 1964, he suffered a breakdown and was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, leading to his discharge. This marked the first sign of the darkness within him. Determined to create a new path, Alcala enrolled in California State University, where he began to explore his artistic side, studying fine arts and honing his skills as a photographer. Seeking further inspiration, he transferred to the University of California, Los Angeles, continuing his fine arts studies and graduating in 1968. His degree would later serve as a facade, masking the sinister intentions that lurked beneath the surface. After graduating, Alcala made a pivotal decision to leave California. Using the alias John Berger, he moved to the vibrant streets of New York City, hoping to reinvent himself and escape his inner demons. In New York, 
Alcala, a tall and attractive man, used his charm and intelligence to ensnare unsuspecting women. Posing as a fashion photographer, he promised his victims exciting opportunities, but instead led them to their deaths. One of Alcala's earliest known victims was Cornelia Crilly, a 23-year-old New Yorker. In June 1971, she was brutally raped and strangled with her stockings in her apartment, leaving her family devastated and the city in fear. Another victim, 23-year-old Ellen Hover, vanished on July 15, 1977. Her calendar revealed a meeting with someone named John Berger, a clue that would later link back to Alcala. In 2012, Alcala confessed to the murders of Cornelia Crilly and Ellen Hover. He was sentenced to 25 years to life, but this would only take effect if California ever released him from custody. Alcala's sinister journey had finally brought him to face some form of justice, but the lasting impact of his actions would forever haunt those he left behind. Number 1. Zacharias Musui. Born on May 30, 1968 in France to a Moroccan father and a French mother, Zacharias Musui grew up facing discrimination and prejudice in a multicultural neighborhood. These early experiences left him feeling marginalized and questioning his place in society. Searching for belonging, Musawi was drawn to extremist ideologies, finding solace in radical interpretations of Islam. Influenced by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, he sympathized with the struggles of the Palestinian people and harbored feelings of anger and revenge. After disappearing for three and a half years, Musawi resurfaced as a recruit for Al-Qaeda. On September 11, 2001, he played a role in the devastating attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, believing he was serving a righteous cause. Following the attacks, Musawi faced legal proceedings and was found guilty of conspiracy in connection with the September 11 attack. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Which of these criminals do you consider most fearful? Let us know your opinion in the comments below.